Welcome back, party people. Mike here with The Social Life of Language, making complex theory simple but never simplified. Think that sounds cool? Hit that subscribe button now. Today we'll be talking about a brand new article that I wrote with Ophelia Garcia entitled Converse Racialization and Unmarking Language the making of a bilingual university in a neoliberal world. I made another video on this article, but focusing on the keywords converse racialization and unmarking. But there is a third and just as important concept in this article, something that we call the language elsewhere. Throughout this research on English-Spanish bilingualism, the idea of a standard Spanish kept coming up. So eventually I just started asking people, where does the best Spanish come from? And I got all kinds of answers. Oh, Spain has the most pure Spanish. Or Puerto Rico has really good Spanish. Or my friend from deep Mexico speaks the best, most proper Spanish. So eventually, I began to wonder, why don't good Spanish speakers ever live in the United States? In all these conversations, people pointed elsewhere. They would literally identify every single Spanish-speaking country in the world, except for the United States. The best Spanish speakers came from far away. The further away, the better. Not one person ever said, oh, my mom speaks the best Spanish, or my dad, or my grandpa. So why is that? Let's find out. Today, we're starting with the keyword, the language elsewhere, and then applying the concept to a bilingual education context. Let's start with some clear and simple assertions, and then we will complexify the idea. First, at the heart of the language elsewhere is its legacy as a colonial invention. Second, the language elsewhere was designed to reproduce racial, colonial and linguistic hierarchy. In this case, in the form of a blunt dichotomy between standard language and substandard language. And third, the language elsewhere becomes what it needs to be to reproduce social hierarchies. It changes names, it changes features, it changes its speakers. At one point, the language elsewhere might have been identified as the language of colonial power. At another point, it may have been identified as the language of racial power. In today's video, we are focusing on the trend in bilingual education where a second language is framed as an economic resource, that is, as potentially an emerging language of economic power. That language is imagined to hold economic power. Okay, let's pause here for some clarification. I just marked out a couple of temporal eras for illustrative purposes. But remember, it wasn't colonial power first, then racial power second, then economic power third. Instead, all of these eras are still with us. It's just that when we press into existence certain framings of legitimate language, oftentimes history gets erased or the old seems like it's replaced by something new. But ultimately, that colonial legacy, that racial legacy, remains. So this would be a good time to discuss how powerful erasure can be, or the moments when we push assumptions so far into the background that they become almost invisible. For example, when we say the language of power, what we really mean is the language of the powerful members of society. We don't mean the language of power, the abstract entity, but when we use phrases like language of power, we make it seem as though that language comes from nowhere. Another widely used framing is when we call something standard language. And again, on its surface, Standard language sounds like the language comes from nowhere. After all, I've never met a standard speaker or a standard person that speaks standard language. I mean, I've met some basic ass people, but that's, that, that's something else. Standard language appears to come from nowhere, but like we say in the article, 
A language from nowhere does not exist. When it comes to standard registers of language, you can bet somewhere along the line there were some anthropologists discovering new languages, there were people trying to translate Bibles and religious texts, and there were linguists discovering new linguistic structures, and then saying these are normal usages, these deviate from normal usages. Now granted that is a simplified story, but the point is, standard languages have a history and they were invented by people. Even if that history has been erased over time. In my research, I focus on Spanish as an economic resource, a language elsewhere, or more specifically, a Spanish elsewhere, which is elevated at times to the status of economic resource. Even a Republican politician from Texas can get behind this idea of Spanish as an economic resource. This is the University of Texas, one of three campuses in the state. Sergio Sanchez is the chairman of the local Republican Party. For me, it's a marketable skill, and I would desire that of all the kids that are going to the university. And because it is an international market and international trade because of NAFTA, it's beneficial. So we got all those global economic words in there. Bilingualism as a marketable skill, as good for international trade, etc., etc. Because we also got to keep in mind the wider political climate which included Donald Trump. That meant Spanish and bilingualism had to be framed and promoted in a very strategic way, especially in Texas. In this next clip, we got another professor pushing the idea that if you are bilingual, if you take the time to improve your bilingual skills through the university, you can add value to yourself. You can become competitive in large cities and all along the border. For the past year, Professor Dagoberto Ramirez has used luck and ingenuity to help lead a new program here. Welcome to our class. It's going to be bilingual. And so that gets at the heart of why is this class important, right? A person with two languages is worth two people. If my students are going to get a nursing degree and they can speak English and Spanish, they will be hired anywhere along the border and anywhere in large cities. The region where this university is located is like 90% Hispanic identifying. And most people here have some degree of bilingual capabilities. But the kind of Spanish promoted in this very large and powerful university is a Spanish from anywhere else but home. A language elsewhere that can be recognized as a standard register that is not marked by a history of the racializing deficiency perspective. The deficiency perspective is a major dimension of social life in this region. Indeed, part of that colonial and racial legacy that is alive and well. And this article is about the very public emergence of UTRGV as a B3 institution. B3 standing for bilingual, biliterate, and bicultural. The university is located right along the Texas-Mexico border. And historically, the area has been claimed by native and indigenous populations, and eventually was colonized by the Spanish Empire, and Mexico, and the Republic of Texas, and the United States, and the Confederacy. And sometimes through all this confusion, the region was claimed by two nation states simultaneously. This is just a friendly way of saying that a whole lot of people died, and a whole lot of languages were erased via colonization. And make no mistake, the hatred of Mexicans and Mexican Americans ran deep. Over the years, racist movements against Spanish speakers often used research on language and bilingualism to prove Mexicans were categorically dumb and handicapped, claiming that they literally suffered from a diminished mental capacity. And a lot of times the research claimed it was because Spanish was an inferior language. At other times, bilingualism was the problem, as in people wouldn't be able to learn either language very well. Unfortunately, the University of Texas system is totally implicated in producing this kind of trash research. Huh? Don't say that? Not professional? Not professional? Oh. 
over time, the Spanish language came to strongly index a specific form of racialized personhood that was naturally deficient, or the perception that Mexicans and Mexican Americans were always lacking in morality, in work ethic, in patriotism, and of course, their English and Spanish were mixed, therefore Mexicans were deficient in both languages. But notice, we ain't just talking about language anymore. This is a totalizing view of Mexican Americans as deficient, an idea that is alive and well although sometimes not so obvious. I'll give you an example of a more gentle and friendly form of the deficiency perspective. In 2014, just before the university was set to reopen as a bilingual institution, we had Professor A express excitement to the Real Grande Guardian, one of the main local newspapers. Here, he said, The idea is terrific. I think it would make this place a very unique one. But at the same token, I think it is going to be extremely difficult to do unless they begin to actively recruit faculty who come, perhaps, from other countries to be in charge of those programs. So let's unpack some of the deficiency perspective assumptions in what he just said. Professor A believes the way to make a bilingual university possible is to recruit bilingual faculty from elsewhere, rather than just recruiting from the bilingual faculty that literally already live in the area. Do you see that deficiency perspective creeping in? But okay, maybe I'm just being a little too judgy. Maybe I'm being just a little bit oversensitive. Well, this particular professor had actually tried running a bilingual course a couple decades ago. From that experience, he says, After five minutes, I had to stop because the students had no idea what I was talking about. They did not have the technical vocabulary. They did not know how to write or take notes, except for the few who were from other Latin American countries. They were very happy to see someone speaking in their own language correctly and they could follow it. So first, we should note that this professor is from Latin America and also characterized his own Spanish as correct. He then goes on to assert that the students who were also from Latin American countries were the exceptional few who could follow his lessons and that those students were excited to see someone speaking in their own language. Okay, so there's a lot of potential interpretations here. But to me, I see a clear division between the local regional Spanish and the Spanish from elsewhere in Latin America. And we should also include that this faculty went on to say that local students and faculty are not truly bilingual and never studied Spanish formally, except those who come from foreign countries, Mexico, South America, or Spain. Again, notice all the countries from elsewhere. Notice the local region did not make the list and the United States did not make the list. As a final example, let's look at the university website. Now, depending on the department websites, Spanish is presented as foreign, modern, and sometimes a global language. Again, not from anywhere in particular, just from elsewhere, or maybe from nowhere, but definitely not the language of the Rio Grande Valley residents who learned Spanish at home. To me, the reason is pretty straightforward. When you steer the conversation toward global economics and state and regional prosperity, it's very easy to not talk about American racism, or the racialization of Spanish-speaking communities, or address the anti-immigrant sentiment that says anyone from south of the border is a direct threat to American life, despite the fact that Spanish has always been integral to American life. You know what language was in South Texas before English? Spanish. So I'm just saying you all realize that English is the foreign language in South Texas, right? Maybe the university should categorize Spanish as a domestic language. Just saying. I'm just saying. So to review, first, 
at the heart of the language elsewhere is its legacy as a colonial invention and mode of domination. Second, the language elsewhere was designed to reproduce racial, colonial, and linguistic hierarchies. And third, the language elsewhere becomes what it needs to be. I'll say that again. The language elsewhere becomes what it needs to be to reproduce social hierarchies. It changes names features, it even changes speakers. It goes by many names, for example, global and modern Spanish, maybe proper and pure Spanish. How about high-level Spanish, academic Spanish, or maybe one of its Spanish language correlates, such as Espanol Académico. What unifies all these different names is the implication that there is a substandard Spanish underneath the substandard language of the home and of the parents. And my worry is that standard Spanish has already been conflated with the idea of the language of economic power, or let's be more specific, the language of the economically powerful. Here's the thing, let's be real for a second. I have no doubt that teaching the language of the powerful will produce successful individuals plucked straight out of our communities. My concern is when we step back and look at the Latinx community as a whole, I have to ask myself, will teaching marginalized and racialized populations the language of the masters really lead to racial equality? Will it really lead to dismantling white supremacy? And in my opinion, no, or to quote Audre Lorde, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Well, that's all for today, folks. Don't forget to like and subscribe, tell your friends, tell your colleagues, and do support this channel on Patreon. This is Mike with The Social Life of Language, and we're done.